Eva. There we go. Now we're live. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you all for attending our session today. Today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Siri Chamardi, who specializes in emergency medicine. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the comments of the YouTube live and also in our Instagram bio at the end. With that being said, you can get started whenever you're ready, doctor. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, I i um, thankful for Web Shatterers for having me here today. My name is Dr. Siri Chamardi. I am an emergency medicine uh, trained ultrasound fellow currently. Um, I work in New York City. And uh, if you want to continue, you know, the learning more about emergency medicine, you can follow me on uh, Instagram or Twitter. So disclosures. Uh, I am emergency medicine trained, so I have a bias and that's that I love um, point of care ultrasound and I think that there's a huge utility for it in the field and in um, medicine in general in the future. Uh, and I'm biased that EM is the best profession so you can always drop any sort of questions regarding emergency medicine. Um, and I think that everyone has the potential to succeed. So I'm really happy that Web Shatterers is doing this presentation so that you guys get exposure to emergency medicine. Also, uh, the title of this presentation is The Case of a Funky Smile and a Ticking Time Bomb. So if you guys already are thinking of what it's about, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, we're gonna talk about a case that came into the ED. This was prior to coronavirus. I'm sure you guys have heard lots and lots about coronavirus already. So we're not gonna talk about that. If that's something you do wanna talk about, you can message me and I'm happy to chat about working in the epicenter uh, back in March to now. So this presentation, we're gonna talk about a 27 year old guy. He has, um, no past medical history, and he's complaining of some frontal headache and uh, right-sided facial weakness. And it's, he says it's been going on for about a day. He also says that he's been having, the headache is associated with light sensitivity. It gets worse when he sees bright lights. Uh, he has some blurry vision and some neck stiffness. He also says that his neck hurts when he moves it. That's like pretty concerning um, and right upper back pain. So other history um, in the emergency department, just like you know, in your medicine rotations, you should always ask about recent travel, recent illness, um, any other meds the patient is on. So we go ahead, we're going ahead and asking this otherwise healthy guy, hey, what were you doing the last couple of weeks? Apparently he went camping in upstate New York and he did get bitten by a tick. He doesn't remember when, uh, he didn't have any sort of rash after that he remembers. Um, and other than that, uh, or he did not, sorry, he, uh, he denied uh, having exposure to any tick. Um, but that's something that we were thinking about. Um, and then the recent illness, uh, he's been having some cold-like symptoms for the past couple of weeks. And this is him right here. <laughs> um, in his review of systems, the things that were positive he did have some eye changes. He had some neck pain, back pain, and headache. So right now, I go ahead and do a physical exam. Um, when doing your physical exam, uh, we're particularly concerned about the neuro exam because this is a patient with a headache and some neck pain. Um, maybe there's some mild paraspinal tenderness, uh, and there's upper, um, like we've discussed, paraspinal tenderness. But also, you notice that he has a right facial droop. Um, so if you guys remember medical school, you learn that there is, um, an association of facial droop with stroke versus Bell's palsy and involvement of the eyebrow is one way we can decide, is this a, uh, Bell's palsy or is this a, um, association with a, uh, spinal or a cerebral stroke? So any other signs we want to test for? Well, if you guys are thinking, yes, there are some other signs we want to look at, you're correct. Um, the uh, signs what we want to look for are Koenig sign and Bruginski sign. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you could probably Google some videos of them. Uh, Koenig is associated with um, hamstring stiffening on lateral rotation of the hip. And Bruginski sign 
is associated with neck stiffness. But they're not very specific or sensitive. Uh, and oftentimes, you still need to do a tap for final diagnosis, a tap meaning a spinal tap. So what is our dif differential diagnosis for this guy? He has some headache, maybe some facial droop. We're thinking about maybe disseminated Lyme. He traveled recently, but no tick bites. Um, idiopathic Bell's palsy. Does he have a complex migraine? You know, that photophobia. Does he have a tension headache? Does he have some sort of viral syndrome? Uh, or does he have a stroke? So it's where the neuro exam gets really, you know, important. Uh, what is your plan for this guy? So in the emergency department, as a student, as you go on and, you know, proceed in your training, you should try to come up with some things that trigger you to order certain things. So we ordered the basic labs, a CBC, a basic metabolic panel. Um, we wanted to do a spinal tap and check some Lyme titers because we're concerned. Upstate New York um, is pretty, uh, is there's, there's a lot of ticks up there. Um, Lyme, Connecticut is actually the, um, the area where that name Lyme disease came from. Um, we want to order an EKG, uh, pain control because the guy is in pain, um, some IV fluids, steroids, antibiotics, and a head CT without contrast. The utility of some of these things, let's discuss them. So EKG, if you're looking for disseminated Lyme disease, you might be able to see some cardiovascular changes. Why are we ordering pain control? Because sometimes it's just a complicated migraine, but we don't know that yet. But we still want to treat the patient's pain while they're waiting so, so that you know they can actually continue to wait in a more comfortable manner. IV fluids, um, this is more or less a choice that you make if they're not able to tolerate PO. A lot of headaches are associated with a lot of nausea. Um, they, it kind of just helps them get through that hump. Um, steroids. So steroids are um, actually indicated for a certain type of meningitis called strep pneumonia meningitis. So um, that's actually the most common type of bug in adults that causes meningitis. So we're just covering um, at a basis for the most common type. And antibiotics because, hey, if this guy has neck pain and a headache and I'm tapping him, you know, for meningitis, you should start treatment because the tap may still be delayed. Um, and a head CT because we want to rule out any sort of tumor or stroke. Um, and without contrast, because in case it's like a hemorrhage causing pain, uh, we want to make sure that we don't, you know, infiltrate that. Um, discharge. All right. So um, ignore the bottom. Okay. Uh, so now we got some labs back. So his white count wasn't really elevated. He wasn't, you know, there was nothing really prominent on the CBC that would make me jump out and do anything. On his uh, BMP, the chloride's a little high. It's always a little high. He doesn't have any AKI, no anion gap. The PT, PTT were fine. Oh, okay. Um, but this is really where, where our key to diagnosis led us. So he did have an increased WBC count in his uh, CHF associated with lymphocytosis, but also associated with an increase in his total protein. And his Lyme titer came back positive. So as you guessed, he has meningitis, Lyme meningitis. So that's where the ticking time bomb comes in. Um, this guy, he was like a 27 year old guy. Sometimes when young patients come into the ED, you know, we often have to make sure that they're truly okay. Uh, I, per I personally feel like a lot of young people prefer not to spend their time in the emergency department. So if they're there, you know, there must be something going on. Um, and this is uh, him uh, saying, I told you I was sick. Um, in the United States, you see that Lyme disease is primarily centered in the Northeast and kind of upper Midwest areas. Like I said, Lyme, Connecticut, somewhere over here is like the old, like place where it was named. Uh, Lyme disease, so we have different types of um, manifestations for Lyme disease. I'm just gonna move this. Uh, so you, we have like 
flu-like symptoms. This guy had a cold-like symptoms for a couple of weeks, all these different manifestations. Uh, this will come into play in a second. Um, you can see bilateral Bell's palsy in Lyme's disease, which isn't super common in a stroke. Um, it could cause meningoencephalitis. Erythema migrans is the classic targetoid rash that you will see on your board exams. Um, and arthritis is quite common as well. Okay, so ticking time bomb, there's different stages of Lyme's disease. So uh, in terms of the initial stages, you'll see that like rash and cold-like symptoms. Later, you might see um, changes uh, like Lyme carditis. And then way later, you might like have some joint changes the most common symptoms. Uh, this is actually a cool case. This was a case where um, Lyme neuroborreliosis induced a startled myoclonus. Um, but you see that you see that this um, the most common symptoms are usually the rash and arthritis. Let me show you guys a video for this. Let's see. You see how it's like he, he immediately like twerks with the initiation, initiation of the clonus. So that's that. And then next, um, interesting Lyme carditis. So Lyme carditis can manifest in different ways. That's why it's super important to get an EKG um, in different um like if someone comes in and you're concerned about meningitis, especially Lyme meningitis, uh, you have a first degree, um, you can have first degree AV block with prolongation of your PR, second degree AV block um, in terms of, uh, you know, either Wenke block or uh, type one, where, you know, you have the prolonged beats with anticipated um, loss of a beat. And then third degree AV block where there's no association with the PR and the QT. Um, okay, story time. Okay, so this case was, happened a while ago, um, probably about three years ago now. Um, but recently, uh, there was a resident at my hospital who uh, came into work and said, hey, I'm having palpitations. That's like not normal for like, you know, young people to just have randomly have palpitations. So a workup was done and this was very similar to the EKG that we got. If you guys look at this EKG, uh, you'll notice something. I'll let you guys take a look for a minute. And if you guys guessed, then this is a actually a type one, um, Mobitz type one AV block, second degree AV block. So basically um, you see a prolonged PR, but with the, like a beat and then there's no beat here, prolonged PR beat. So it's like a two to one. Um, so ultimately that resident wound up staying in the CCU was diagnosed with Lyme carditis. So it can happen to anyone anyone at all, make sure if you go camping, uh, especially if you go in the Northeast area, that you're aware of any sort of ticks uh, and um, be, very, be very careful. Uh, other late manifestations of Lyme can include Lyme neuroborreliosis. Um, and you see here that there's like actual like intimal proliferation plurifer and lymphocytic proliferation of, um, Sort uh, of Lyme neuroborreliosis, and then uh, you could see like actual changes on an MRI, which shows like areas of dissemination uh, within the brain. Uh, what is the treatment for Lyme? So your classic board answer will be doxycycline, and that is for anyone above the age of eight years old. If they're under the age of eight years old, you can consider amoxicillin. Um, and you know, that's how you treat it. Very sick people. So uh, the, there's this like concept of chronic Lyme disease that has emerged. And basically um, it's because a lot of Lyme patients end up with a lot of long-term health problems. And you might have them following up 
for, you know, the severe joint pains and swelling with the rheumatologist to like kind of control some of these symptoms. So that's how I think that that concept kind of came up. And it's Lyme time. So we talked about this. <laughs> Make sure if you go uh, anywhere, um, it's still fall, so there's still an opportunity to do so. You're wearing all the proper gear uh, in order to protect yourself. Uh, these are some of the references, and this is a uh, lime jello. Um, and this is a uh, kind of it. Um, I'm open to taking any sort of questions if you guys have any. Sorry, it was kind of short. <laughs> Hi guys. Dr. Chamardi, if you um, pull up the chat box, I'm going to be typing some questions in there for you. Okay, sure. Are you able to see the questions I'm typing? Yeah. What does dissemination mean? What do you, okay. Um, I'm going to answer the um, question about dissemination first. So disseminated Lyme means that it has spread to other parts of the body. Um, so if it affects your heart, if it affects your brain, if you get like Lyme carditis, or if you get like Lyme meningitis, that is disseminated Lyme disease. Um, more or less like you know, some people with Lyme, all they, all they get is like a cold and you'll never know that you've had Lyme disease and that's it. But other people, if you had that tick on you for longer than 24 hours, you got, you know, you might develop like the carditis and, um, stuff like that. Um, what does your typical day? Okay. Hmm. What is your typical day in emergency medicine? So emergency medicine is a lot different than other um, specialties. The um, main reason is because the way that we operate is we go in and we don't um, talk about, uh, we don't, or we don't like know what we're going to see that day until we show up. So that's, I think that's something that really separates emergency medicine from a lot of different specialties. We have to be prepared for anything and everything. And um, when I go into a shift, it could be super busy or it could be super not busy. And most emergency departments are divided up into like the sick area and like kind of the fast track area. And you could be uh, scheduled to work in the fast track where you might be seeing a lot of patients with like lacerations, um, uh, like ankle sprains, stuff like that. And you might be in the really sick area where you see like patients who are, who are crashing, who have, you know, respiratory distress and uh, whatnot. Uh, so how long does it take for you to notice any development of symptoms after tick bites? Um, this could be variable, actually. Uh, you might not ever notice, but usually within the first two weeks, if you, um, if you have erythema migraines, you might be able to see that. Um, what made you choose emergency medicine, stressful case? Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the stressful case after I talk about kind of my journey and um, why I chose emergency medicine. Uh, I uh, grew up uh, in the United States. I'm, I went to a public university for um, undergraduate school. And one of the things that um, I wanted to do is I had already volunteered at a hospital. So I wanted to do something that where I really got patient contact. So I actually became EMT certified during my undergraduate, um, edu like undergraduate um, journey. And I think that that really gave me a perspective of what medicine is like. Um, and it made me want to do something where I was directly in contact with people um, uh, throughout kind of um, when I'm like, you know, and motivated me to pursue medicine. So then I uh, went to medical school. And I think that a lot of medicine, unfortunately, is like, um, there's a lot of cracks in medicine. And a lot of it is like deciding what to do at what point. And um, 
for a lot of patients who uh, have never seen a doctor, I noticed that a lot of the times they came to the emergency department and not really like sought like primary care. So I thought it was a great way to work with underserved patients to practice whatever I learned in medical school. Guys, I still think about the brachial plexus. Believe it or not, I was reviewing knee, knee anatomy the other day so that I could um, properly perform a joint aspiration. So emergency medicine, you apply everything you've learned in medical school, pretty much everything. You might not be doing like chronic cancer treatments, but you are saving patients' lives on the daily basis. And you're like um, applying most of what you learned about medicine. Like if you have a lupus patient and they're in respiratory distress and they're hypoxic, in medical school, you learn about like um, anti-cardial uh, lipin or antiphospholipid syndrome. And you always consider like, hey, does this patient have like a PE? What are the risk factors like so it's it's actually like great in that sense like it makes your education like really worth it um other reasons why i chose emergency medicine is because um uh it's like it's a great way to kind of um work with society on inequities like in your emergency department you can kind of uh make sure that things are equal for patients and also at a higher level a lot of emergency doctors are involved with kind of these organizations where they deliver health care to underserved areas um process okay the process of becoming ultrasound trained uh you have to do a fellowship after you do your residency uh, it's a one-year fellowship um and that's how you can become ultrasound trained. Most emergency medicine residencies have a curriculum where you can learn some of the basic ultrasounds, but if you wanna do advanced applications like um, nerve blocks or um, do like transesophageal ultrasonography during uh, resuscitations, um, that's really where uh, ultrasound training comes in. Um, uh, Okay, um, Lyme disease causing heart palpitations. So uh, it's specifically, I do not know the pathway, but I'm sure if you look it up, you can definitely find it. Um, I would have to review that myself. Uh, what are your favorite types of cases? Um, so I'm gonna talk about cases for a second. So um, a lot of emergency medicine is not as glorious as you think it is. When I go to work, I'm not like, oh my God, I'm gonna like tube five people today and put in central lines and these people and dialyze these people. That's not really, uh, unfortunately, like that's not really what emergency medicine is. It's a lot of counseling. Um, I spend a lot of time with my patients talking to them about things that, you know, are kind of obvious, but hey, no one has ever told them. Like, um, you know, one time I had a patient come in for abdominal pain, left upper quadrant, uh, kind of concerning for gastritis. They had, he had been discharged on um, Pepsid. And basically, uh, after a couple of weeks, he came back and he's like, hey, uh, can you re rewrite a prescription for that medication? And someone else um, had discharged this patient. And I was like, hey, this is an over-the-counter medication. You have gastritis. Like we could totally do something about this, but you need to follow up with a gastroenterologist and you need to continue taking this medication and it's totally available to you. A lot of what you're doing is like uh, helping people navigate this like healthcare system. Um, we have a lot of people who come into the emergency department during their lowest uh, points in life. Um, during coronavirus, that was kind of the case is where a lot of people who are really young uh, and really sick, um, like 20 year olds who were requiring oxygen and um, that's not usually the case. Usually 20 year olds are pretty healthy. And, you know, we had a lot of people die during that time. Um, in terms of my favorite cases, I enjoy, I enjoy critical care and I also enjoy the fast track. Um, I really, I, I think there's something therapeutic about, um, lacerations. Uh, it's just like people are so grateful and you haven't even done that much. You're like, okay, I put in some stitches into your like finger. Like this is not that exciting to me, but for them, it's like, 
like, oh my gosh, like you fixed me, like, look at how it healed. And one time I had a patient and I fixed a laceration of his lip uh, with absorbable sutures. And a couple day or a couple weeks later, I'm walking across the street from the hospital and someone is yelling at me across from the across the street. And I'm like, I don't even know what's going on right now. And it was like the same guy who I like, fixed his lip. He's like, doctor, you saved my life. And he, he showed me his lip. He, it's like kind of flawless. And um, we're not even like plastic surgeons, but the way they, the way that people's bodies heal is like crazy. Um, so that's like really rewarding um, in terms of uh, other things, most stressful case. So I think a lot of the critical care cases are really stressful. Um, and I think uh, in terms of like other things that affect it, I think during coronavirus, some of those critical care cases are probably the most stressful cases that we had just because we didn't know about treatment. We were giving people steroids. We put them on oxygen to support their breathing and kind of we can't put them on something called BiPAP. Um, which is a form of ventilation uh, that aerosolizes pretty quickly, but usually a lot of people put people on BiPAP before uh, kind of like that intubation state in order to oxygenate the lungs and see if they don't need a tube in their throat. So we had to use high flow nasal cannula instead. And I had some patients who were always like teetering in that like low 80s, high 70s, and you just have to, you have to look at, you have to continually clinically assess them and make sure that they're truly not in respiratory distress and it's hypoxia. And, you know, you have to make that clinical judgment. Do I intubate this patient? Do I not intubate this? Do I continue them on high flow and see how they, see how they do? So that's kind of, um, in terms of like stressful cases, <laughs> this year has been a, a, a ton of stressful cases from COVID. Um, prior to COVID, I feel like uh, some of the uh, difficult, difficult cases, like um, actually recently I had like a really difficult case. I had a CHFer who um, also through PEs was on anticoagulation, but also had a GI bleed and then also had an RV strain. And it was like every diagnosis that you can imagine critical care wise. Um, that was, uh, that was kind of the most stressful case. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, favorite type. Okay. COVID has affected work. Um, so as emergency trained doctors, we're the front lines. So we definitely treat anything and everything. And we are, um, in addition to being um, emergency doctors, we spend a majority of our time outside of the ED. We spend about seven months in residency in the ICUs. So we are also very critically trained. Um, and in terms of how COVID has affected our work, I think we increased our capacity to see critically ill patients. And also we, uh, we have to wear masks all the time, which is fine. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people who come into the emergency department who are far sicker than, um, far sicker than before. Um, so that's just something that I've noticed is like a lot of people prior to coronavirus might come into the emergency department, like for an HIV test, but now you would never step into the emergency department until you are literally like at the cusp of, you know, something dangerous. Um, as a woman of color, EMT, the, the subspecialties work life balance, families in distress. Uh, I have, I feel like. I work in New York City, which is such a diverse community. As a woman of color, I feel like, um, not really from my colleagues, but from my patients as a woman, uh, they call me all these things that I prefer not to be called, like honey, sweetheart, uh, and oftentimes nurse, even though I introduce myself as doctor. And I feel like that's really, uh, it's really like a culture that, you know, we are trying to continually Kind of bring attention to and you can correct your patient you can say hey no i'm i'm your doctor like we're trying to make a med medical decision here um i took emt classes uh at night so i had um i took like the normal course course load for a college student and then 6 to 10 p.m uh either three days a week or two days a week i don't remember it's been over 10 years um 
I took the class at night and I got certified in one semester. It was like a 10 week or a um, like 12 week long course. Um, so that's how I got certified as an EMT. Um, what are their subspecialties? There are over 24 different subspecialties of emergency medicine. You can literally do anything. Uh, if you're interested in women's health, you can do women's health. If you're interested in cardiovascular diseases, you could become like that EKG specialist. If you're interested in uh, scuba diving and hyperbaric medicine, you could do hyperbaric medicine. It's like literally there's emergency medicine is like an all encompassing specialty. Uh, how is my work life balance? It is fine. <laughs> I feel like uh, emergency medicine is one of those specialties where you're actually able to separate your work from your home life because um, at work, you go to work, you have shift work, you have patients, but you have no primary patients that you carry on from day to day. So you're really able to go to work, hustle hard, do your best. And then um, later, uh, like when you go home, it's like your shift is done. You can't, you can't really change, you know, what you've done. And also you won't be seeing the next patient the next day. So it's done. Uh, da -da. I think you learn about how to communicate well and all those other things throughout the different things that you do in life, but also you do get training in residency on how to communicate with distressed families. And also you should through medical school. I know we had an OSCE specifically uh, directed for uh, difficult patients during medical school. Uh, I went to medical school in Georgia. Uh, at the Medical College of Georgia. And I went to residency at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm currently a fellow at, um, at Columbia in New York, New York. Any tips for pre-meds, COVID, board care, number of shifts? Okay. Um, I'm going to quickly address the number of shifts. So I, uh, it depends on your practice. You can work anywhere to, in terms of being a full-time emergency doctor, you can work anywhere from 16 to infinity as much as you want to work. Uh, that's kind of, I think like 16 is like the low end or either 12 or 16 is like the low end of uh, number of shifts, but they all vary depending on hours. Uh, usually you're contracted for a certain number of hours. It's different. I'm in training right now. So it's like little different. Um, do you ever consider, uh, I did consider other specialties other than emergency medicine, but I love treating people from birth to death. And also it's like amazing to be able to have the skills if someone needs it to um, help uh, like on a plane or in like a, like a situation where you don't really have a, a lot of resources to really still be able to practice medicine. And I think that that's something unique to emergency medicine is we're trained to practice in like, the wild. Um, let's see. Uh, I fellow is like uh, the um, things that you uh, or the training that you pursue after residency. So uh, it, it's like a normal uh, sort of term uh, designated to post residency, pre attending, full attending kind of training. Um, okay, so let me go back into entire COVID situation. I started. Uh, Yes. Um, so there was a question about uh, entire situation of COVID. Patients definitely do have a fear of contracting um, coronavirus when they're in the emergency department. And that's also something that I tell them if they decide to come back that they should consider calling their primary doctor if there really isn't like an emergency diagnosis to make and also um, to make sure that they're taking the right steps to protect themselves like wearing a mask and not traveling. Um, any tips for pre-meds? I think this is a really useful question for you guys. A lot of you guys, I'm assuming, are either pre-medicine or medical students. Um, okay, one tip, uh, really important. In the time of coronavirus, even if it is Zoom or not Zoom, I would do the things as if they were happening um, in real life. So if you have an interview with a medical school, please show up in your blazer or your suit. That is just kind of, you would never meet like a, you would never meet like a chair of a department without your blazer on in real life. So don't do that. Like 
make sure you're dressed professionally during um, during those sorts of situations. Any interviews, any conferences, just dress to impress. Uh, there's really not going to be a way to distinguish yourself, but um, this will definitely make sure that you don't harm your application. Um, any other tips? Um, so I would say be persistent. Um, at this time, you should ask um, medical schools, hey, do they accept interest letters? Do your research, um, figure out why you wanna go to that medical school. You can write an interest letter if they accept interest letters. I definitely did that throughout the medical school application process and I feel like it helped me. Um, you can communicate with your interviewers after your interview, which is something that I didn't know until later on in the medical school cycle. like if you had a particularly good interview and you just sent a thank you note, you could say, hey, um, any update on the status of my application, which might be more important now than prior because of uh, everything being virtual and really how to distinguish yourself. Um, and um, there's, let's see, other things. Uh, if there's other things that pop up, I'm gonna come back to that tips for pre-meds because I think that's useful for you guys. Um, yes, I find it frustrating for patients who can't afford care, but luckily most hospitals have like charity care or um, there's referrals that you can make to free clinics um, hosted usually by county hospitals, which is kind of the place to go. Like, hey, you can get care here um, and this is something um, that you can do. Uh, let's see. Um, I did, like I said, I considered other specialties in, uh, prior to emergency medicine. I don't remember if I answered this. Um, mainly if I hadn't done emergency medicine, I'm trying to think, um, maybe internal medicine, but I really like peds. So probably not, uh, family medicine. I don't really like preventative care. I'm not a huge, uh, I mean, I, I like it, but it's not my forte. So I, probably not that, uh, anesthesiology, it's very procedurally driven, um, those are like the main ones that come to mind. Um, how do you cope with tough days? Honestly, it's really hard, but everyone needs something. And I am a huge foodie and I love food. And I live in New York City, which I'm really lucky. So sometimes I'll just order from my favorite restaurant or I'll get like a tub of my favorite ice cream and start eating it. And I, I know it's like, um, Everyone needs something, but that's kind of my stress relief. Um, so during COVID, it's really hard to get experience in the healthcare field, but working as a professional is different. Um, I'm, I, I do believe that if you do decide to train and um, kind of become like an EN, EMT, that's like a possibility to actually work even during COVID because people will always need kind of frontliners throughout that whole thing. So if there's a second surge, you might be called in to kind of get some of that experience. A lot, uh, if you're interested in emergency medicine, I would definitely say that that's one of the best ways to kind of get int introduced to the emergency medical service system of our country. In New York, um, the emergency medicine technicians are pretty highly trained. Um, and they actually were running codes um, and maybe not bringing them to the hospital if they were coding for uh, over a certain period of time where there's no like a uh, viable or um, like, you know, prospective like outcome for this patient. So um, I would definitely, I, I honestly think that that's like the single singular way that you could if you were interested in emergency medicine is to get EMT certified. Um, we, I think at some point did experience some shortages of PPE, but my hospital was generous enough. And this is something you should look into if you're a medical student to make sure you choose a residency that cares about its residents and will protect its residents during this time. So um, my hospital definitely made sure we were protected. I would never go to work without any sort of protection um, because you're putting your life at risk. Uh, so our institution did a lot to keep doctors safe. Um, we definitely had like, uh, we were required to watch like a, a donning and doffing session. Um, so a lot of things are, it's kind of interesting guys. So 
when patient, you know, you all know how to put on a gown, but how do you take it off safely? And is that where people were getting infected? And I think that's really what caused a higher level infection of people for, for those people who are constantly taking on and off gowns versus just leaving like a bunny suit on the entire time. Um, so make sure you learn proper donning and doffing um, in order to, uh, in order to kind of protect yourself from COVID, uh, if you're if you are going to be in a clinical setting, um, emergency medicine is a very difficult specialty. Um, but the I think that I I knew had a sense of, that it was more counseling and less adrenaline than I had imagined. Um, but it's it's really you do have to love everything in order to um, be a good emergency medicine doctor because you have to be able to tell people, hey, you're losing your pregnancy. Hey, you have cancer. And I'm, I know you're 20 years old. And this is like the worst moment of your life. Um, so you like really have to like know your stuff. And uh, I have a lot of gadgets and tools and like things like Guillain-Barre syndrome or, you know, uh, like, like I said, like you, you could even like an ectopic pregnancy, you have to be able to kind of learn, um, learn like all the pathologies and be able to apply the most dangerous ones to your practice. So that patient with GBS can get an ICU bed to make sure that their breathing doesn't get worse. Um, or, you know, that patient with an ectopic pregnancy can go to OB and get like either methotrexate or, you know, get a surgery. So what are interest letters? Interest letters are um, letters that you, if you look it up, interest letters, medical school, um, they're like, letters that you can write stating that, hey, th I'm really interested in this medical school and these are my qualifications slash, this is something cool that I've done, which I think reflects your mission. Um, did you do shadowing or research as an undergrad? Um, shadowing was quite tough for me. Um, so I come from a background where neither of my parents are doctors. I, no one in my family is a doctor. So it was really hard for me to get um, experience um, in medicine. So I unfortunately didn't have an opportunity to do an, a whole lot of shadowing. I shadowed like one doctor like once because they allowed me to. And then that was kind of it. Um, when I volunteered at the hospital, I volunteered in an ICU and some of the doctors would kind of like let me watch some of their procedures from like, like way afar. And that was kind of shadowing, I guess, but technically I was also doing like volunteer work. Uh, did I do research as an undergrad? Yes, I did. Um, I was a neuroscience major. Uh, so I was in the sciences. So I did research related to neuroscience during that time. I did not, I did not publish. So you don't have to publish. You just have to learn the scientific process and kind of show that you have an interest somewhere in medicine. So like they will help reflect on that. If you do publish, that's great. You don't have to. Um, and if you can shadow, that's great. Um, that'll kind of, you know, be better for you. But if you don't, didn't have contacts like me, then, you know, it's okay during this time to kind of do some web shadowing and um, kind of figure out like, hey, what do I like based on what's presented to me? Oh, med school is so hard. Okay, um, medical school is really incredibly different in the United States versus other countries. And you are responsible for so much information. Uh, I really think that it's, it's a one step at a time kind of thing things will not make sense until the end. Uh, for me, uh, I know step one studying, that's horrible. Like, you know, you really have to dedicate your time. Um, but having focus will take you further than just motivation because you can be motivated one day and not motivated another day. Really like pushing yourselves to set like short-term goals will be more beneficial to you. And also, it's tough. You need to have hobbies outside of medicine. You can't just sit in a library all day and study. For me, I saw my friends um, outside and uh, we would hang out. We would do like a trivia night just for fun. Um, and we would, you know, eat out or 
Um, there'd be like class parties and stuff after major tests. Uh, a lot of this isn't existent, but another thing that I did would be to um, work out. Um, so maybe if you like, if you like that, I, I think that it's a great form of stress relief and uh, you really, you really feel like good, good changes in your body. Um, med school process. One other thing that I want to mention is that an important piece of advice I was given for my clinical rotations is for surgery rotations and a lot of these rotations that are notoriously hard. Um, I, I think like a key tip that I was given was like, do not talk unless talking like spoken to. And it actually immensely, I feel helped me like kind of stand out because you don't want to be that annoying student who's like, oh my God, like, what are we retracting right now? Like, no, just like silence and you might get pimped or whatever. Make sure you're ready to answer those questions. Like if you're on like, you know, vascular, make, make sure you know your anticoagulants, you know? So like, those are, those are kind of the, um, the ways to set yourself apart. You, you should be able to kind of truly um, uh, be able to present a patient. And that's also one other thing is like make an outline like HPI, family history, uh, allergies, uh, medications, like where you have it all outlined. So when you present a patient that it's super organized and that's, I think something else that can make you stand out, especially during clinical rotations. Um, there's one thing you would change or improve about medicine. I think that it, like one thing is like, it's really hard to access the medical system in America. Like people have no idea, like, I feel what the purpose of certain things are. Like the emergency de department exists for emergencies. And sometimes people kind of abuse that. And I think continually educating people about like the proper resources for, you know, their sort of problem and also making uh, basic healthcare more accessible is something that I would change. Also, uh, a lot of, a lot of doctors spend a lot of time documenting everything. Uh, and I would try to make that, um, I would make that as, uh, as like, Flaw, like flawless kind of as possible because um, I know if I see 30 patients, I also spend a significant time amount of time, especially if some patients are sick, documenting critical care time, documenting procedures, documenting this. It's like, whoa, like that's kind of the more overwhelming part. So somehow, um, somehow doing that. Uh, was your medical school pass fail? No, my medical school is not pass fail. Uh, honestly, Okay, my opinion about this might be different from other people, but I feel like not being pass fail is a way for you to distinguish yourself um, from your colleagues. Uh, no, I was not a straight A student. So <laughs> by saying this, I'm, I'm just saying like, it's it, it's easier to say like, hey, I, uh, I got an A in surgery versus I passed surgery. Like you, you don't really know if someone's good at it, you know? And it's a way to, it's a way to, I think really like rank people on the same system. It's something that I feel helps students and they don't realize that. Um, did you have good communication skills before medical school? Um, I think that if you're pre-med, I would do as many things as possible to increase your leadership and your communication skills. So, um, like all those things that you do outside of medicine can definitely help you with medicine. Uh, for example, being able to like delegate tasks as like the president of yada, 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 it might help you with a code situation because in a code, um, you have people who are like a code meaning like a cardiac arrest. Um, you have people who need to be on compressions. You have people who need to be um, delivering meds. You have people who are keeping time. And it, it kind of gives you that like leadership in order to say, hey, okay, this is what we're going to do. You do this, you do this, you do this. Um, so whatever you can to increase your, um, your ability to be a better leader and a better communicator. And that that's what I would focus on during pre-med too. Uh, I personally participated in a club 
um, which was folk is called Circle K. It was focused on service, leadership, and fellowship. And I grew a lot from that experience um, and being able to kind of organize or delegate and, you know, truly like, uh, truly be able to, you know, be someone that people look up to. Uh, medical school will help you though, in terms of certain types of communications, talking about uncomfortable topics like, hey, do you have any uh, STDs? Like that's kind of like more of the skills that medical school will help you with. Um, and also kind of having those really difficult conversations with people like, hey, um, listen, your father, your mother, they might not make it. What would you like? Like, what would they have wanted? Those kinds of, um, those kind of conversations will happen like during medical school, during residency, you'll have mentors who will kind of be able to um, address some of those, uh, some of those questions with you and kind of put out layout out there that you can kind of go ahead and reciprocate or you can kind of go ahead and uh, have that example to go off of. Um, and I, I, I think that most medical schools are pass fail. Uh, let me see. I'm, I'm just going to make sure. I think I answered most of your guys' questions. Two, three. Shadowing research. Institutions, doctors. Do not, do not, do not, do not. Please don't go to a training program that does not protect its residents. That should be your first priority. Resident wellness and protections for residents to stay safe during this time. Your life is worth more than that. Um, yeah, I'm interest letters, okay. I think I answered most of these questions. If you guys have any other questions, you're, you can go ahead and email me. Um, I did uh, put a plug in. Um, if you guys want to learn more about ultrasound and are interested in critical care, I write for a website called criticalcarenow.com and I contribute to their ultrasound um, content. And I also have, you can also follow us at Columbia EM Sano on Twitter uh, if you're interested in ultrasound cases of the week. Um, and then I think you're back. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Chamardi. This was such a wonderful presentation. Thank you for taking the time to answer all of our questions. It was so, so helpful. Um, to everyone watching, the Google form has just been posted in the chat box and it'll be posted in the Instagram um, soon. So if you fill that out in the next 30 minutes, um, we'll close it after that. Um, thank you so, so much again, Dr. Chamardi. This was wonderful. Thank you for having me. Oh, just to, just to summarize guys, okay. You don't have to have someone in medicine to go into medicine. That's one thing. Everyone can succeed. Um, you will find opportunities out there. You'll never know when they come. And the third thing is just wherever you go, whatever you do, put, put out 110%. So if that means dressing to impress, do that. <laughs> if that means, you know, making sure that even though it's just a, it's just a cover letter, like having that title page, do that, like find out ways that you can distinguish yourself. It's going to help you a lot during this time. And you guys are going to do great. You have really great questions. Just email me. Hey, Siri, MD at gmail.com. If you have any more. <laughs>